Next topic for the India Today Conclave 2010 is on India's population, dividend or disaster. I request now Session Chairperson Pratap Bhanu Mehta, President, Center for Policy Research, to invite our esteemed guests to discuss this very topic, India's population. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for David Bloom, Professor of Economics and Demography of Harvard University. Thank you. Kindly be seated. We are beginning the session now, ladies and gentlemen. If you could just have the door shut of the hall, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, India Today Conclave, for give me, giving me this opportunity. Since we are already running late, I will do what good chairs ought to do, which has become part of the furniture very quickly. Um, I just want to say that this is a, it's a double um, privilege to be introducing this session. First, because I think of all the topics that are being discussed at this conclave, perhaps none is more vital to India's future than figuring out the question, India's demography, dividend, or uh, disaster, uh, I think it's going to set a, a really a whole framework in which, we, in which to think of India's future. Uh, the second reason it's a privilege to be introducing this session is, uh, of course, because of who the speaker is, uh, David Bloom, uh, with whom in sort of different times have sort of shared two institutional affiliations. But um, he really is one of the outstanding uh, intellects of our time. If somebody can be described as uh, who's truly revolutionized our thinking about the relationship between development and demography, demography and economics, David Bloom has done it. I think the very phase demographic dividend, uh, which has uh, become the axis of so much of our thinking, uh, owes uh, something to him. He is Clarence James Gamble, Professor of Economics and Demography and Chair, Department of Global Health at the Harvard School of Public Health and has a publication list uh, that would really exhaust uh, one's lifetime of reading. So I won't stand between you and David Bloom just to welcome him and uh, thank you for um, uh, what, what will be uh, a really astonishing session. Um, thank you, Pratap, for those uh, very kind words of introduction, and good morning, uh, still morning, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I feel very honored to be here at the Conclave, uh, both for personal and professional reasons. Uh, on the personal side, uh, I'm a son-in-law of India uh, for 27 years now and counting. Uh, I always feel very welcome here, and my relationship with India has transformed me in many ways ranging from my taste in food and film to my view of the world's problems and possibilities. So thank you all for that. As you've also just heard from Pratap, uh, I am by profession an economist. That means that I'm a member of a tribe that's increasingly said to know too much for its own good and not enough for anyone else's. It also means that I've been trained to take matters that are perfectly obvious and to make them utterly incomprehensible. But this morning, I'm going to try to break with that long-standing tradition and take a few complex realities and make them appear a bit more obvious. My talk focuses on India's population, which has in the past grown very rapidly and been something of an albatross weighing down the Indian economy. The simple point I'd like to make in this session is that India's demographic profile is now very much in flux, and that it's changing in a way that's becoming quite favorable to economic growth. My goal is to explain the logic and evidence in support of this point. I'll also stress the need for Indian policymakers to avoid complacency, since the right set of policies can accelerate India's demographic transition and magnify India's demographic dividend. Alternatively, India could experience a demographic disaster if the country falls prey to a number of pitfalls that lie on the path ahead. To develop this point, I'll start by introducing you to two recent breakthroughs in thinking on the impact of demographics on national economic performance. 
Then I'll highlight some salient features of India's demographic profile and examine the implications of that profile for economic growth in India. I'll then explore the opportunities that India has to further enhance its demographics and discuss some potential demographic threats to India's economy. So we'll begin with the, the new ideas. And uh, to provide some context for these ideas, I'd like to acquaint everyone with some key facts about world population. So this chart that you see plots world population from 1950 out to the year 2050. The points from 1950 to 2010 are essentially historical data, whereas the points after 2010 are UN projections, which are the most widely used standard in this area. The chart shows us that the world's population doubled from 3 billion to 6 billion between 1960 and 2000. And I can tell you that that occurred on the strength of roughly 2% annual growth. Now, a 2% rate of growth may not sound like much, but in demographic terms, a 2% rate of growth is huge. For example, a 2% rate of growth leads to a doubling of population after 35 years. After 700 years, the population increases by a factor of 1 million. After 1,200 years at a 2% rate of growth, the people occupying the planet would come to outweigh the planet itself. And after 6,000 years at a 2% rate of growth, the mass of human flesh would be expanding outward from the Earth at the speed of light. So as we proceed, please keep in mind that a 2% rate of growth in population is quite high by demographic standards and is absolutely unsustainable over the long run. Now, the green area at the bottom of this chart refers to India, uh, whereas the red area in the middle refers to China. I'll have some more to say about that uh, as we proceed. Based on the numbers underlying this chart, India's population is currently growing at a rate of 1.4 percent per year. That's less than the wildly unsustainable 2 percent rate I mentioned before, but it's more than the 1.1 percent rate for the world as a whole, and it's double the rate of China. I would also point out that the India-China differential means that India is projected to surpass China in population size as India's population approaches the 1.5 billion mark. The countdown to that day has already begun. It's only 18 years away. Now, the study of numbers like these and their implications for human well-being has a long and colorful history. A major figure who helped to get the ball rolling with respect to the study of population was the Reverend Thomas Malthus. Just around the time that world population reached 1 billion, he made a very famous prediction related to what he termed the irrepressible passion between the sexes. Uh, needless to say, and perhaps in contrast to the session this morning, uh, that prediction wasn't a prediction about all of the pleasure and happiness that would be born of that passion. Rather, Malthus asserted rather grimly that exponential growth of population would always tend to outstrip arithmetic growth of food production, and he predicted that mass starvation and human misery would be the inevitable result. Malthus's brand of population pessimism is still with us, but his predictions of mass mortality have not been supported by the evidence. During the past few decades, rapid population growth has been accompanied by a phenomenal decline in mortality rates and by an increase in income per capita, both globally and also here in India. In addition, during the past decade, there have been two notable steps forward in thinking on these matters. Uh, these are the breakthrough ideas I referred to earlier and to which I'd like to turn now. The first idea is the observation that when it comes to the determination of income, there's a lot more to demographics than just population growth. In particular, the age structure of population is also very important, especially when it shifts as a result of baby booms and busts and their echo effects. To appreciate this point, we need to first understand something called the demographic transition. This is a model that demographers use to describe the nearly ubiquitous change countries make from a regime of high fertility and high mortality to one of low fertility and low mortality. But it tends to happen in an asynchronous fashion, with death rates declining first. Now, um, 
as I say, death, death rates decline um, first and followed by a decline in, uh, in birth rates. And uh, a result of that pattern is a transitional period of population growth, uh, which has traditionally been the main focus of economists interested in demographics. But that's not the whole story here, because as all demographers learn in Demography 101, Mortality declines in high mortality populations are mainly associated with declines in infant and child mortality, due typically to increased access to vaccines, antibiotics, safe water, and sanitation. That causes a baby boom, but it's not the usual baby boom that we're used to, in which there are more births. This is a baby boom that's caused by those babies that are born having higher survival rates and getting launched in life. The baby boom ends when fertility subsequently declines, which it invariably does as couples realize that fewer births are needed to reach their targets for surviving children and as those targets are moderated. Baby booms are very consequential economically. They're consequential because lots of children require lots of resources for food, for clothing, for housing, housing for education, and for medical care. Those resources don't appear out of thin air. They have to be diverted from other uses, such as building factories, laying down infrastructure, and investing in R&D. And that diversion of resources tends to slow the process of economic growth, at least as it's conventionally measured. But then the iron law of demography kicks in. Now, you all know this law because it tells us that with the passage of every year, our age goes up by one. Sometimes this is analogized to a python that swallowed a pig, where the bulge in the snake marks the progression of the pig through the snake's digestive tract. It's important here because it means that the baby boom will invariably reach the working ages within a period of 15 to 20 to 25 years. And when that happens, the productive capacity of the economy expands on a per capita basis and a demographic dividend is in prospect. The dividend is a composite of four distinct forces. The first is the swelling of the labor force as the baby boomers reach working ages. The second is the rise in women's workforce activity that naturally accompanies a decline in fertility. The third has to do with the fact that the working ages also happen to be the prime ages for savings, which is key to the accumulation of physical capital, human capital, and technological innovation. And the fourth force is the further boost to savings that occurs as the incentive to save for longer periods of retirement increases with greater longevity. Now, the quickest way to appreciate the practical importance of these forces is to compare the economically and the demographically most extreme regions of the developing world, by which I mean East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. On the economic side, the tall blue bar that you see on, uh, on your left uh, has a name. It's called the East Asian Miracle. That label refers to the fact that never before in history had such a large group of countries grown their average incomes so rapidly and for such a long period of time. It was dubbed a miracle by the World Bank in the mid-1990s because it seemed to defy explanation. That's what you do when you can't figure something out. You call it a miracle. <laughs> In contrast to East Asia, on the right side of this chart, we have Sub-Saharan Africa, which has exhibited the worst economic performance of any region during those same years. Average per capita income growth has essentially been zero in Sub-Saharan Africa during the three decades between 1975 and 2005. Okay, now let's go from the economic side of the picture to the demographic side. And in this chart, what I've plotted in red is the ratio of the working age to the non-working age population in East Asia. And I plotted that ratio in blue for Sub-Saharan Africa. The working age population is defined as the population in the age interval 15 to 64, while the non-working age population is defined as the population less than age 15 or age 65 and over. The height of these lines, to just make this as simple as possible, the height of these lines essentially tells us where the pig is in the python. In other words, when there are large numbers of people in the prime years for working and saving, that line is higher and moving up. Now, with regard to this chart, please take note of the following. First, the ratio of workers to non-workers has been lower in sub-Saharan Africa than in East Asia throughout the entire period you see here. 
That's a reflection of the relatively high burden of youth dependency in sub-Saharan Africa due to its long history of high fertility. 